figure out how to move forward uh, with the whole story of Jesus as Messiah and following Jesus and doing things the Jesus way. That's what this, this letter is about. And today we're just going to read a few verses. It's in 1 John uh, 3, 16 through 24. I'm calling this today, I'm calling this uh, love and action is greater than words and speech. Have you ever heard the saying that, uh, I, what is the old saying? Actions are better than words? I actually speak louder than words. I knew it before I got here today. And then I lost it when I got up here. All right, so that's how, but yeah, actions speak louder than words, right? We all get that. We all understand that. And we all really, I think we subscribe to that, right? Don't we mostly, we subscribe to the idea that, you know, it doesn't matter what you say to me. I can tell how you feel about me by what you do. I, I, it doesn't matter what you say you support. It matters what you're supporting. <laughs> it matters, you know, you can say that you care about these things and then vote for someone who makes policies that are absolutely antithetical to the things that you say that you believe in. Mm-hmm. Not to get political, right? But it, it's, a, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to, to see how a lot of times we say that we believe things, and yet our very actions are the things that are going against the thing that we say, that we subscribe to, that we subscribe to, that we believe in, that we have given our lives to, and it's just weird. And, and, and I, think, I think in America right now, you know, there's a lot of frustration with uh, you know, church, uh, especially white evangelical church, but just church in and of itself, there's a lot of frustration. And I think what I hear, what I hear is that it's, it, it's because we say we believe something, and yet our actions prove that we actually believe and think the very opposite of the things that we say. And so church Membership is is dwindling in America and in the West because I think we have a real serious hypocrisy problem. Now, I think all of us are hypocrites and I think all of us have struggles and that's not the issue. The issue is when we're so dogmatically saying, this is what we believe and our God is right and it is truth and this is, and we are loving, (laughs) right? And then we're doing everything in our possibility to match, to make sure we marginalize people we disagree with. Is it gonna, is, it, is the structure gonna hold up? God's unhappy. It's not with me. It's with, it's, it's with all y'all. <laughs> so, so do you see what I'm saying? There is, there is definitely, I think we all believe this. We all get it. I think the problem is we always think it's somebody else that does it. We always think, you know, oh well, yeah, well, I'm glad we're not like that church. I'm glad we're not, I'm glad we're action people, not just words people. Well, let's be careful. Can we ask ourselves the hard questions today? And can we allow for the spirit to show hypocrisy in our own actions and words? Is that Okay. I mean, is it okay to, to, to not think that we've got it all figured out? Is it okay to always constantly and consistently allow for the word Jesus to, to infiltrate our own lives and our own actions and our own behaviors? Is it okay to do that? Because if it's not, then I'm sorry, we're gonna end up in the ditch on the other side and both ditches are deadly right? We yell at them in their ditch while we are all the time crossing over to get to our ditch. And when you're in a ditch, you can't do anything anymore. You're not going anywhere anymore. You're stuck. And so I just feel like we've got to be very careful that we don't ever get a, a, the word of God would call it the haughtiness, you know, an arrogance, uh, this attitude that, that we have arrived, that we figured it out. And, and so I think that here at Simplicity, we are on the right direction, on the path. Let's be careful not to hit the ditch. Are you with me? So in 1 John chapter 3, 
uh, we're going to start in verse 16 through 24. You can read along here with me. We know love by this, that he, speaking of Jesus, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. Oh, there it is. That's right out of the gate. We ought to lay down our lives for one another. How, this is a great question. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and then sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? There's a question to ask yourself, right? Now, really quickly, you can come back to me and then we'll go back to that. But really quickly, what happens here is, is this is where we start to check out and start to make down the marks of the people who don't get it. Amen? Not an amen, really. That's, a, that's more of an oh me than an amen. That's, that's like, yeah, I mean, how, how can we say that love abides in us when we have the world's goods and yet we see people in need and we can consistently just not help? And if your first reaction is to think of someone outside of yourself or outside of simplicity and to exempt ourselves from this question, we are headed for a ditch. Amen? You can amen that. So that, that's, that's the problem that I'm seeing is that, is that we are very quick to, in America and in American religion, to look at other people and these verses apply to other people. And we can name off names and think of institutions. And, and the whole time we're not really allowing this to impact our own soul and think about, well, what, how is this working itself out in me? But, all right, let's go back to this. Little children, let us love not in word or speech, here it is, but in truth and action. And by this, by the way, that, that sounds like he's saying just quit talking about it. Just don't talk about it. That's not how we love. Love is not talk. Love is action and love is deed and love is the, is the way that we do this in truth. And by the way, it doesn't say that we love truth. It says that we love in truth, meaning that the truth of what we're doing is the action. Are you with me? I think a lot of people in church say, well, I love the truth and I'm standing up for truth. It's like, well, what you should be doing is what our Bible tells us to do is to act in truth a loving way. The truth of how we act is loving. Are you with me? So in truth and in action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and we will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us, all right? So let's skip down. I wanna skip down to this next paragraph. And this is his commandment, talking about Jesus, that we should believe in the name of his son and love one another just as he commanded us. All who obey this command, these commandments, his commandments, abide in him, live in him, and he lives in them. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit that he has given us. All right, now, how can we have, those of us who have the goods of the world and we see the needs of others, how can we say that we love when we don't help? When we don't help. And I think that right there is the crisis of the American church, at least the US American church in the world. The optics of saying that we are loving and yet the truth of the action is not very loving many times. It is a refusal to help. 
It is a refusal to sit down at the table. It is a refusal to understand someone who is different than us, that looks different than us, that has different skin color than us, that grew up in a different area than we did, that has a different uh, understanding of gender or sexuality than we do, who loves someone that is the different, than, that's not heteronormative, right? That doesn't seem like it's the way that we grew up. I mean, the problem with most U.S. Americans is that we, we move ourselves into enclaves that look, we all look the, the same. We all worship the same and we vote the same and we, we eat the same foods and we like the same music. And by golly, like we're never around anyone else that's different than us. And so when somebody says, you know, man, this community feels like we're being oppressed. It's like, well, I never see that. Of course you never see that because you're not a part of that community. The question is this, why are we as believers in Jesus, why are we not in communities that are not like us? Why do we not do that? Why are we not exposing ourselves? Why are we not learning about other people? I, I mean, really, I'm serious. Like, why are we not reading books about people that have different experiences than we do? Why are we not eating at restaurants foods that we never really thought about combining. I, these are practical things, but I, I mean, I'm just saying like, it's like we live in our own worlds and we end up in ditches. And, and, and in the meantime, the people that are on this road just trying to make it through life are being ignored. Their needs and their desires and their wants and their hopes and their futures are being ignored by people who claim that we love everyone. And so I think the church has to do better, amen? I, I, I just think that we need to do better. I think we can do better here. I think we do a lot. I think we do a lot at Simplicity. There's not a lot of other places I would wanna be on this Sunday morning than here because of the type of people that we are becoming. But I think we can do a lot more. Amen? I think we can do a lot more. This, this pandemic year has really screwed us up. And the reason why is because it isolated us even more. It isolated, we pulled back even further into our own kind of homogeneous uh, enclaves where we literally only were with just people like us. And online, we just spent hours upon hours upon hours in echo chambers, just reinforcing our own opinions and attitudes and political and spiritual views. And so we have, we've got a lot of work to do to come out of the cave. We got a lot of work to do to follow up on the commands of Jesus. It says, love them as I have loved them which means laying down your life, amen? So this is, this is not, this isn't easy. This is not a, this isn't just come to church and, 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 and feel good about yourself. I hope that you can come to church and find hope and find love and find affirmation and find peace, I really do. But I also hope that you will find there's a little, there's a little twinge of, 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 of conviction that the spirit of God is saying, let's keep going, amen? Let's, let's go a little bit further. Let's take one more step. Let's go just a little bit more uncomfortable. <clears throat> Are you with me? So uh, I am, as you know, I'm in um, Phillips Seminary right now. And uh, I've been there almost three years and I'll probably be there for another seven. <laughs> I'm taking my time. So, uh, so every now and then my classes collide. They, 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 they coincide and there's these beautiful kind of bridges between classes that I'm taking. And then sometimes the classes collide and they also collide with the lectionary. And that's when you guys are in trouble <laughs> because I have so many hours of study this week between history of the church, uh, 
part two, <laughs> and then uh, ethics of Christ, or Christian ethics, how, how we live out our lives as Christians in an ethical, moral way. Those two classes and uh, in First John 3 <laughs> have collided this week. So I've read um, a lot of stuff, and I've been studying a lot of stuff, and, and, and man, it is, it, is, uh, it is unbelievable some of the things that, that I think th- that can help us and that we can look at, that can motivate us, and that can challenge us and convict us in our own lives. Um, I read a book in our ethics class. If you want to pick this up, it's an easy read, but it will absolutely uh, challenge you. It is called Solidarity Ethics. Solidarity Ethics. It's a transformation in a globalized world by Rebecca Todd Peters. This is a Christian view, a theological view of ethics, which means there's a lot of ethical views out there uh, that don't incorporate theology, that don't incorporate a Christian response to problems. And they are very valid, uh, but they're just not. Uh, they wouldn't coincide with using scripture or talking about what the popes have said in their papal bulls or what the churches have tried to do, right? So, but this is a great book. If you want to know Christian ethics and one view of how this person believes theologically uh, we should act in the world, excellent book, Solidarity Ethics, all right? In this book, uh, Peters is her last name. Peters talks about uh, lots of different things that are going on in the world and ways that, that Christians can respond. This is where I want to uh, do a couple of things over here on the board. Um, first of all, uh, she tells us that uh, some statistics, uh, $6 billion a year uh, could feed, oh, I'm sorry, uh, could, could provide basic education for every child in the entire world. Six billion dollars could provide education. That's not a good, could provide education, all right? Six billion dollars a year. Uh, for nine billion dollars, we could provide clean water for everyone in the world, everyone. Did you know that a lot of people are dying in the world? See, this is where the first world, this is where we don't get it. We say that we love, but we don't take action. Um, Because guess what the the first world has? Most of us, unless you live in Flint, Michigan, most of us have clean water and we take it for granted. But guess what? That That is one of the world's goods. Like it says in 1 John, how can you have the world's goods and see someone in need and not help, right? You, we have resources in the first world. We have water that just, we turn on a tap and it, it comes. And by the way, if the water ever does go down for a couple of days, you get weird, <laughs> right? Like we turn into really, really horrible people fast, There are people that are just simply dying all over this world today just because they don't have clean water. How much do we really think about? I mean, I'm asking myself, have I done anything for that? Have I contributed anything to that? Have I thought about that? Have Have I used my voice from this pulpit to say to our congregation, can we think about this? Not very much, have I? Maybe this might be the first time in two years of being a pastor here that I'm talking about this specifically. Maybe we should do better. For $9 billion, we could provide water for everyone in the world, clean water. For $6 billion, we could provide education for every child in the world. And you think, man, this is, that, is, that is a lot of money. Like, how are we going to do? I mean, Israel, that's six billion. That's nine billion dollars. Like, how, how are we going to do that? Well, did you know that in U.S. America, every year, we spend eight billion on cosmetics? 
Now, I'm not saying don't wear makeup because you're evil. I, I just want you to think about in the grand scheme of, of really like the entire world and what we need in order to survive. I mean, is eyeshadow trumping water? I, I just want you to see that, that it, we don't, how many of you even think when you go to CVS or Sephora that, that oh, you know, that, that we're contributing $8 billion, right? Like, like we don't, it's just like, I'm just picking up some cosmetics. It's not a big deal. Now, uh, please, again, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have makeup or all, I, I'm just saying when you think, oh, it's too much, really? We spend eight billion on cosmetics and nobody ever died because they didn't have eyeliner. Well, <laughs> some of you might think you might. <laughs> Adam Lambert, who's a singer. No one, really? Adam Lambert, come on. <laughs> that dude wears more eyeliner. I mean, who's the, who's the guy from, Never mind. forget it. Um, all right. <laughs> This one will get you. Hey, are you guys tired of me talking about Americans? All right, okay. So in Europe, <laughs> you're like, yeah, stuffy Europeans. <laughs> Those horrible Europeans, $11 billion a year. You ready? <laughs> On ice cream. We don't, in the book, she doesn't provide the U.S. number. <laughs> I bet it's more. <laughs> I bet it's more. $22 billion, right? We want our Ben and Jerry's, right? Like we, now think about it. Like now, cosmetics might be one that might be a little bit, for some, that might actually, there's people that have scarring and they have issues and, you know, and you're like, well, I need to cover. That might be, but ice cream? I mean, are you going to come at me for ice cream? You're going to say that, you know, Israel, we can't do these things. We can't just spend six billion. You know how much money that is? I mean, we can't just willy-nilly go throwing that money around. Just, I mean, where is it going to come from? Uh, I guess your ice cream budget, Europe. <laughs> Can you lay off the gelato? There's people dying. Uh, are you with me? Are you with me? Because th this is what I'm saying. It's like it becomes quite obvious pretty quickly that, that our priorities in the first world are a little skewed when it comes to the rest of the world. Did you know that, you know, we used to call it third world countries, Right. Um, there's, a, there's a movement to call it two-thirds world's country, and the reason why is because two-thirds of the population of the planet live in undeveloped areas. So you have, you have thirds. This one-third right here lives in first world, where we get to spend $8 billion on cosmetics and $11 billion on ice cream. While the two-thirds of the world, guys, two-thirds of the world doesn't have clean water, doesn't have education, many times doesn't have electricity, barely making enough money to survive one day. Are you with me? <laughs> This is a fun Sunday. Let's do this every week. No. All right. So th this, is, this, is, th this is showing that we have the world's goods. Are you with me? We have the goods of the world, and yet there are brothers and sisters that don't, and they have need and it, it just seems like in lots of ways we're refusing to help and to meet those needs. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Israel, there's no way that 20 of us from Oklahoma City and Simplicity Church can make a difference, and I disagree with that. 
I think that we can begin to spread the word. I think there's ways that we can begin to vote. I think there's ways that we can begin to live our own lives that spread the attitude and the understanding of living in the way of Jesus, a solidarity ethic where we're not just saying, well, well, these, these are, you know, we just, listen, because none of us chose to live here. You were born here. Amen? None of you worked hard to get to the first world. 